part of the Press Play Podcast Network. Hey, before we get to today's episode, I want to spend a few moments to thank you for checking out this podcast. It truly means a lot. I started Press Play Podcast in 2018, and five years in, we've grown to about 16 shows with over 20 hosts and have a handful of contracted producers. It's a great little operation with two shows in the top 5% of all podcasts and some of the best hosts and journalists you'll ever find. I've learned so much and absolutely love talking to people that have helped me become who I am today. If you're interested in learning more about Press Play Podcasts, you can check out our website at pressplaypodcast.com or search us in any podcast platform you use. We mainly cover sports and entertainment. We have a Browns podcast, a Cleveland Cavs podcast, a Guardians podcast, a baseball card collecting podcast, and two other sports talk shows. We also have a movie podcast, the Fanfare podcast, which I co-host, a book club podcast, a TV show podcast, a Marvel podcast, a DC podcast, and even a Broadway show podcast. My show is very nuanced. I hope you enjoy it. If you do, feel free to subscribe and leave a five-star review. That will help other people know that you enjoyed the show. And without further ado... Welcome to the Chase Smith Podcast, a conversation on current events and culture. We are proudly part of the Press Play Podcast Network, empowering diverse voices to launch professional engaging podcasts. With me today, and I'm so excited, a legend, and I don't say that lightly, a legend in Cleveland sports broadcasting. Listen to this. Listen, Just listen. Listen. An 11 time Emmy Award winning sportscaster. He's in the Cleveland Broadcasting Hall of Fame. He's a winner of the Chuck Heaton Award from the Cleveland Press Club. He's the host of the Guardians on the Land MLB podcast right here in the Press Play Podcast Network. He also hosts his own show, Intelligence Talks. In 2008, he retired from full-time anchoring with Fox 8 and moved on to full-time living, the one and only John Tellich. John, thanks for joining the podcast. <laughs> I am so excited to be on with you, Chase. Uh, you know, we've been on with your your network for almost a year now. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I've been retired since uh, I hung him up in uh, – in february of 2022 and it's been a whirlwind and i'm more busy now than i was when i was working full-time uh, chasing uh cavaliers browns and uh, guardians and buckeyes and saint vincent saint mary kids all over the all over the landscape so it's it's fu- it's been great retirement has been amazing but the journey to get to it was You know, I was so blessed to do it for so many years and obviously, Chase, to get a chance to do it at the same TV station for, you know, I'm still doing Friday night touchdown our high school football coverage. So um, which I'll never give up. I love that. But to do it more than 43 years is 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 a super blessing in in our very fickle uh, broadcasting business that we are in now. I'm very blessed that they even want to look at me, much less uh, have me around. So it's, it's, it's a good it's a blessing, my man. That's great. And now, you know, friend friend of the network, John Sables over at Fox A with Ken. Yep. They got a, they got a great group over there now, man. Not that they did it before, but just they they just keep on rolling. Yeah, we got a lot. Of, uh, 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 we I had I worked with some amazing people. Not and not to make this about Fox Eight. I know we want to talk Guardians, but I mean, over the years, I was blessed to work with so many phenomenal. Uh, sportscasters. Uh, Casey Coleman uh, uh, was one time the voice of the Cleveland Browns. Uh, He passed away in 2016. He was a warrior uh, that spent a lot of his uh, last years making other people sober and off of drugs. Uh, He Mm -hmm. had quite the journey that he was on himself. So I worked with Casey and, of course, uh, uh, Vince Cellini and Danny Coghlan, who's still with us, the Riz, Tony Rizzo, of course, Kenny Mm -hmm. Carmen, now there now, John Sable, who you mentioned was was one of my interns, PJ Ziegler. Um, We've just had so much. uh, Allie LaForce, uh, you know, with TNT and the NBA uh, was with us uh, in our first year, year and a half of the business. So what a, a group of folks that I was blessed to work with. But um, again, in my retirement, I, I have the best teammate that there is, and that's the bride of 47 yes. years, my wife, Jane. And and she is she's the leadoff hitter and the cleanup hitter in our house. I love that. <laughs> you know, before we uh, press record, we were talking family. You, you have had three kids. We have three kids. And yep. uh, we didn't really talk about our better halves. 47 years, John, that's incredible, man. That's incredible. It, it it really has been a phenomenal journey. You know, Chase, we met at college and it was a blind date. Uh, we met uh-huh. on, a, on a blind date and, and it worked out fantastic for us because 
I was a year ahead of her at school, Ashland College. It's now Ashland University. And when we were at school, um, we met, as I mentioned, met on a blind date. I, I, What do they say about first impressions? Uh, They're lasting. Well, I thank the Lord that this was not a lasting first impression because she thought I was the biggest idiot on campus. But somehow she saw me a second time and uh, we dated and we got married. Uh, in 1976, in the summer, 71776. I probably shouldn't give that out. It's more than likely hackers will find a way to get personal information on me. Oh, but uh, we got married then. And uh, a year later, we had the first of our uh, three children. And it's been a whirlwind journey um, and, and a real blessing that I have her because I mentioned before, TV stations can be fickle. The business can be mm-hmm. fickle. And it's hard to keep relationships strong in this business because it tugs at you in so many directions. I have, uh, you know, the woman who, if if not for her, I would be like Chris Farley living in a van <laughs> down by the river. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, my wife and I, Leslie, 14 years, the 28th. And, yeah. uh, you know, I thinking about that this week because Jimmy Carter, former president, uh, Jimmy yeah. Carter, his wife. Rosalind passed away this week and she did. Yes. Yeah. He said uh, he was interviewed, I think by Katie Couric at some point. I don't know if you saw this going around. She ran off a bunch of his accolades and his awards and like the peace prize. And he's like, the, the, the thing I'm most proud of the thing that I like when a champion is it, she Rosalind said, yes. Like that was like his like most <laughs> proud moment that when he asked her to marry him, she, she said, yes. Uh, and, yeah. Uh, and, just... and mine is mine stuck with me all mm-hmm. these years and believe me. Uh, and I was joking somewhat about the Chris Farley uh, reference there, but uh, so many aspects of my life improved the minute uh, that this gal from Long Island, New York came into my life and, and then even greater when she said yes, yeah. and we got married 47, uh, going on 48 years ago. So really blessed, Chase, to be to be perfectly honest with you. It's amazing. I, I was saying I'm going to text you for like parenting three kids advice, but now it's going to be <laughs> just for marriage and life advice, John. I'm, uh, I am so thankful just to have you here. Uh, but this is not a marriage podcast. This is not a, a parenting <laughs> podcast. This is right. a, a podcast about the Cleveland Guardians, and yes, I don't sir. know. Who else to talk with other than the one and only John Telich? So, so John, uh, you you hosted this Guardians pod for us all year long, um, and I I can't help but not not think that a lot of people were disappointed in yeah how this year ended up for the Guardians after such a promising and a, a exciting season last year. Uh, I I think everyone and what. Fans and probably uh, like a lot of the players and staff were expecting a, a little more this year than what was it, 76 and 86 or something? Yeah, a, a third place in the division mm. just didn't work out, Chase. And, and you know, you could point to a lot of things. I think, I think the, uh, they went out and got Josh Bell, didn't seem like that worked. They go out and get the veteran catcher, that didn't seem like it was working for them. They assumed, and I don't know if they assumed, they felt maybe, uh, you know, Sponge Pop, SpongeBob uh, SquarePants himself, uh, Oscar <laughs> Gonzalez, was going to continue uh, doing what he did, but uh, he had his issues. Uh, but it all goes back to uh, before the season started, uh, Tristan McKenzie uh, with his issues, and then it just kind of snowballed, and it and it it affected the team uh, going forward, and it showed the strengths of the organization by how they went and got the kids from the farm and the kids pitch well. And I'm sure we can go into more detail about specific uh, pitchers, but um, they just didn't have that offense. And, and as, and as, as opportune as they were uh, the previous season at last at bat hits and, and, you know, down to the wire ball games that they were the recipients of good fortune per se, uh, it just didn't happen this year for them. Their power was down worst in baseball in terms of, home runs and all of those uh, stats that you could recite out of a, you know, obviously out of a book, uh, but it just, it, things were missing, you know, just things just did not seem to be clicking. They were kind of like the the Cavaliers were in that playoff series mm-hmm. against the Knicks. You know, they had such a great regular season. Then they go into the series with the Knicks and just things weren't clicking. And next thing you know, boom, rude awakening, yeah. they're out. Um, and the Tito thing, it didn't affect the team, I don't believe, early in the year. But then once the news kind of squirted out and the trade deadline came and they didn't initially do any do anything, which 
prompted the big shots in the front office to go on the road to, to try to massage their 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 egos and, and answer any of their fears. Um, and uh, and then Naylor being injured at the same time, it all kind of snowballed yeah. and they're on the outside looking in. You know, it's interesting you brought up the Cavs because uh, I think in a lot of ways, these franchises like favor each other, right? They have a lot of promising young yeah. players that are cornerstones of teams that you expect to be around for a long time who yeah. had a lot of success early that maybe took both leagues by surprise and then just kind of yeah, whether they came crashing down to reality or, you know, just part of like the learning curve uh you can't help but be excited about the future of, of this club, which we'll talk about, about later. Sure. Um, sure. But this season, I think it just had to leave a bad taste in, in, in their mouth. Yes. The injuries to, to McKinsey, who they were touting before he was injured as like, yo, this guy is going to like impact yeah. the league. Like this is, this is his year. Um, and so that was a tough way to start. Um, and then to, to be almost, they were kind of sellers at the deadline. Like they, they kind of they just like rolled over. Um, yeah, they didn't seem to be uh, b because it was it was a year where when the deadline came, they were obviously very much in shouting distance. I mean, they yeah. were there. I think it's like and three, yet, three it, or five game. Like there was some like three to five game gap like throughout like that that part of the season. Very catchable at that yes. time of the year. Very doable. Um, my gosh, uh, you know, look at I think the Diamondbacks. Uh, where were they? You know, uh, in right. the middle of the summer, nobody's talking about them. And then, right. you know, how far they what they were able to accomplish. So, you know, you look at that, uh, the, how things were at the deadline. And then the weird part was then afterwards, they went and got all the bargain basement that, you know, the guardian yeah. angels, ha ha ha. Uh, and went and picked up those guys. And you're thinking that was clever. Um, mm -hmm. But you wanted to see a little bit more commitment at at that at, at that trading deadline it didn't happen for them uh the whole year they still you know were missing the power the the outfield uh you know certainly needs a boost more power in the outfield uh, you can throw some names out you know potential guys to go and get and all that sort of stuff but uh just everything didn't really seem to work for them didn't seem to click for them uh, and that's a shame because you know chase they had they had almost 42% more attendance at the ballpark this past year. So you had more people going to see them in person. And uh, now as we head into the off season, you wonder about some stuff, you know, the payroll projects to be like 83 million, somewhere in the eighties. That's very low by everybody's standards, obviously. And then you wonder about the effects of this whole baseball, the, the Bally sports contract, yeah. they got like 55 million was a 50, 55 million from it in 2023. Uh, they're kind of in limbo right now with that diamond sports group and Bally sports and who's going to take over the broadcast. What, what can they get out of it? Will that affect the bottom line? Uh, you know, did, did they make the recent move uh, with trades with that in mind? You, you know, a lot of speculation when, uh, the team is is trying to do it with smoke and mirrors sometimes with the payroll the way the way it is. Yeah. You know, I uh, Cleveland is a Browns town, and it, it, it has been, and it probably always will be. Uh, I think the Cavs make a lot of noise, but the Guardians are always third. It's just how it seems yeah. to always be, and I, I can't help but think, uh, with Tito retiring, it kind of saved the team a lot of negative like conversation or headlines or yeah. some, why didn't they do whatever? I think Tito almost like the last great thing he did for this club was this, these like expectations, whether they are fair or unfair with these young yeah. players going into year two kind of like took the heat off of them and yeah. kind of absorbed a lot of that. And no one wanted to crap on the team when they're celebrating Tito, the greatest, the greatest manager in club history. I'm, I'm going to say that. I mean, I don't think it's, yeah, it's, I, I um, think so. And Absolutely. so I, I think as disappointing as it was, we didn't see the full volume of that because it was Tito's last hurrah. We wanted to celebrate him. Yeah. I, and, you know, you could tell that he was beaten down somewhat, uh, yeah. not just by, you know, them not playing as well last year. But I think it was just the the accumulation of the last several years where he missed time and and, and Sandy had to uh, fill in or or you had, um, you know, instances where you just could tell that, you know, he was laboring. And and so you hope now that, you know, he gets a, a clean bill of health. He already had the shoulder, I believe, 
taken mm-hmm. care of. There's more stuff that's going to happen for him. You just want him to be happy. I mean, this guy won manager of the year yeah. three different times in 11 years. That's absolutely absurd. It's phenomenal what he did, and especially the uh, ability that he had to come into a, a situation and then that year already you know, take them to a wild card game against Tampa and, and become uh, manager of the year for the first of those three times. Um, mm-hmm. You're right in some ways. You know, it's like you're going – out on a picnic and you and the and and the Indian the, the Guardians rather the Guardian state of being uh late in the season was you know they're going to be having a picnic on this dirt grass you know, broken up and stones and bottles broken bottles and then Francona was this beautiful tablecloth that they kind of spread over that to <laughs> mask it so that you would think about wow we're going to have a nice little picnic here that's going to be cool it's and like you, you use really words think for it. a living john it's like you use words for a living that was beautiful <laughs> i well uh, and it just popped into my mind and just as quickly <laughs> it, it left on the other side um but it, so he was able to mask that and and truly the great ones do that chase i think mm-hmm. in any realm i could recall asking mike brown i can recall asking dan Gilbert, uh, all these uh, people about uh, about LeBron saying, can you get a true sense and a true evaluation of how good you are when you have a transcendent transcendent talent that yeah. kind of covers up is 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 the the masking agent is the is the duct tape that that uh, makes you not think about those those poor aspects of your team. And I think Terry Francona had that kind of ability. Um, phenomenal communicator. Um, the, he read the room well. He knew how to play off the young kids. He was self-deprecating. All those uh, not holier than thou uh, made fun of himself a lot. But he knew the game. Had the nice. Uh, I thought he had the nice mixture between. You know, there are guys that stand there with the analytics guy right on their shoulder, and he was aware of all that stuff. But he still, oftentimes went with his baseball instincts because he grew up in the game. He played the game. Yeah. Um, he's managed the game. He coached the game um, and he went and did it his way. So um, they were very fortunate to have him as their manager for, for the, those so many years. But I will say this, and I always, I do defend them at times uh, because they are in a league where it's so slanted at times towards the big money uh, uh, teams And yet that's no guarantee, as we've seen. We saw it this year, the Mets, the Yankees, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Not a guarantee that you're going to be in the fall classic because you spent more than $200 million or whatever it is. And and so with Francona, you got pure baseball. You got uh, a man who really, you know, would handle that back end of the bullpen, who could set things up as well as anybody. And um, you just wanted – I always wanted to see what they could do if they had – you know, a budget even close to what some of these other teams had. And that's why I go back and say it was it's a good organization in the sense of the belief in the guys in the front office in Antonetti, in Cherney, and and all these guys that work to that work so well together um and are always seem to be one step ahead of the posse when it comes to just uh, deciding what's the best front office type of talent. A lot of their guys go elsewhere and flourish and do well in other organizations because of what they were taught there. And and, and I think that, you know, they've always had that. But, um, it, gosh, it would be nice to have a franchise that has that forward thinking and um, that ability to be out there in front of people, but yet uh, has the kind of money some, some of the other big boys seem to have. You know, I loved how you uh, were describing Tito and kind of gave us a little behind the scenes of how he is in the clubhouse, how he is with the young players and the way that you were describing him uh, kind of sounded like almost like a little bit of their new manager, right? Steve Vogt uh, yes. seems to share a lot of those same kind of quirks that made yep. Tito a favorite. Yeah, I think he does. And that was, uh, you know, I I uh, popped around and, and listened to a lot of the experts, a lot of the former uh, players, uh, uh, Yonder Alonzo, uh, individuals that, you know, have network jobs or are in the limelight and can and give you uh, their opinions on on trends and things of that nature. And all of them spoke glowingly of the potential for what Steven can do. Very closely removed from actually being a player. He was yeah. a good player in his in his career. Two times he was 
an all-star, one of those guys you'd see come into town. Ah, you know, he just had that kind of gritty uh, sensibility about him. Um, a guy that's been a bullpen uh, in the bullpen as a coach very early in his coaching career, as we've seen, because he's only been out of the game a couple of years. And it seems like those types of guys um, seem to flourish as managers. Uh, they just have a better handle on everybody else in the organization. They're thoroughly prepared. Um, other guys were likening him to Buddy Black. That's a very nice compliment. Bud's done very well as a, as a coach and as a manager, if you will, in Major League Baseball, former uh, Cleveland Indians pitcher, as you all know. And so uh, there's a lot of good uh, vibes about him. I, I get I get yeah. a real nice sense about uh, Stephen. And so we'll see. We'll see yeah. what happens as he takes over a young club with uh, still a lot of question marks, but but first and foremost with that young pitching core that we saw a lot of this year uh, and that was a blessing in disguise per se uh i think it portends for uh, an exciting year coming up um with that pitching as the kind of core focus and strength of the team yes i i wasn't shocked you know i think catchers on a baseball team they're kind of like the quarterback of of the team they yeah. do a lot that maybe fans don't realize whether they're calling plays or you know i i know players look look you know, to the dugout for shifts, but the catcher kind of has all that in his brain. And and yep. um, it, it's not shocking to me that a catcher so, you know, closely removed from playing is able to translate that well into coaching. And yep. I mean, he seems like he's going to fit into Cleveland. It seems like he is like almost destined to, uh, <laughs> to manage following Tito. And it, it seems, you know, like Tito is going to, you know, you know, obviously he's not going to be there, but I, I, I can imagine, um, Tito being available to, to, to Steven for any type of, you know. Yeah. I, I, you're you're he, saying, well, will he be a phone call away to, I would think he certainly wouldn't turn down any phone calls, but I, I get the sense um, as the year ended that he really wants to see how life can be for him uh, without being in baseball. Speaking uh, about uh, Terry Francona, although yeah. I, I certainly wouldn't, um, you know, first of all, get healthy. You know, that's number one for him. Yes. So you get healthy and, and get more peace of mind, kind of a, uh, get the anxiety out of your, 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 your psyche, if you will, because it was a very difficult job fighting his illnesses and then trying to be a, a major league manager in a, in a, in a competitive league and all that stuff, just take care of that stuff. But I still think the love of baseball, that's not going to leave him. The, my love of television hasn't left me in a year and a half. <laughs> yeah. I still love all my former colleagues and 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 all that sort of stuff. So I think, you know, he'll stay close as as close as he wants to be. Yeah. Um and and I know I know they would certainly welcome him any kind of advice that they send out his way and he's able to um uh, send back their way. But I think Stephen, you know, uh he's going to need some people to lean on, but he mm -hmm. seems like just a real stand up kind of a guy that will be able to handle this new environment for him. And a lot of people say, well, he, you know, what, why are they, here we go. They hired a manager that, you know, had no, no uh, managerial yeah. uh, experience, but it's worked out for other guys in the past in this organization. In fact, the greatest one in the history of the Cleveland Indians was their player shortstop, shortstop manager, Lou Boudreaux in 48, the last time this franchise won a World Series championship. They were being run by a 28-year-old shortstop who happened to be a Hall of Fame potential player, which he was, uh, and so they were able to get it done. I'm not saying Stephen Stephen was a Hall of Fame player, but um, he's not that far removed from being a player himself. So if he can navigate that, you know, the, those days where they're going to look for some real tough leadership, and then also he'll be able to walk across the divide where they say, ah, this guy, it wasn't that long ago, he was one of us. And so, you know, how do we ramp up our respect for him in the manner that we maybe had for, for Terry Francona, who had earned it as yeah. a manager all those years, World Series championships, going to the World Series here in Cleveland, all that stuff. So it's going to be fun to see how he navigates this whole thing. And I, I just have a good feeling about him. We'll, we'll wait and see what happens. Yeah. John, let's take a quick break. When we come back, I want to talk about some offseason moves, the young pitching core, and a little outlook on 2024. Some more exciting young guns for this club that just kind of keeps these top prospects. Uh, stick around the Chase Smith podcast and the Guardians of the Land 
MLB podcast. We're going to cross post this to both feeds. Um, Chase Smith, John Telich, we'll be right back. The holiday season is here, and if you're looking to get your girl some jewelry, maybe a nice set of earrings, you need to check out Lorraine and Lynn. Lorraine and Lynn makes polymer clay earrings, which are lightweight, flexible, and perfect for every occasion. My wife and I both have multiple pairs. Actually, our daughter does as well, and they are so comfortable. We love them, and and they look fantastic. You can find Lorraine and Lynn on the web at lorraineandlynn.weebly.com or on Instagram. I'll make sure to post the links in my show notes, and now... Only for the Chase Smith Podcast listeners, you can use code CHASE10 at checkout for 10% off your entire order. That's CHASE10 at checkout. You will not be disappointed, and I promise you, you'll quickly find yourself wanting another pair of earrings from the Rain and Lynn. Check them out. All right, we are back. The Chase Smith Podcast, Guardians of the Land, MLB Podcast, special episode. John Tellich here. We're talking Guardians. Uh, we just... Uh, had so much fun talking about the season at large. Tito, Steve Vote. Uh, here we are. Uh, we're in. The, we are in the off season, and the and I almost said Cavs. The Cavs are playing the <laughs> 76ers right now on TNT. It is <laughs> the in season tournament. Um, they uh, one of the more surprising moves. I think some people just because it's a name. Uh, pitcher Plesac was uh, as a free agent. Was that something that you were ex- expecting, John? Um, you know, I think he kind of reached the end of his his road with the uh, the organization. So I think you know he's not going to be part of their plans, at least in my estimation. I think what you want to look forward to seeing is what happens with some of those younger uh, pitchers that came in in uh, 2023 yeah. and really uh, showed what they can do. Uh, uh, the, you know, we saw Logan Allen, we saw Tanner Bybee, second uh, uh, man in the league, and in the voting for American League uh, Rookie of the Year, had a phenomenal year, had the most wins on the team. He won 10 games, uh, ERA just under three, really impressive. And then the big Haas, you know, Gavin Williams, so much potential and promise there. So in, you know, going into next season, you're going to be looking at those three guys. Now, of course, the situation with um, uh, Bieber is what it is. I mean, right now, um, because he had that injury that he dealt with for much of the latter end of the season, that's going to affect uh, what types of suitors may be out there or what type of compensation would be coming the Guardians way as far as that is concerned. So, um, you know, you still have that youngster, Daniel Espino. He's on the 40 man roster, uh, but he hasn't pitched in all, you know, almost two years now, Chase. But he was at one time thought to be the best young pitcher in you know, in the system. So there's wow. some names to think about. I'm just excited to see the growth from mm-hmm. Logan Allen, the growth from Williams and the growth from Bybee from year one to year two, because in year one, for obvious reasons, they, T- Terry was trying not to, you know, use them too much because, you know, he wants that growth pattern in their careers to be such uh, where they can have good success this year that last year and then uh, develop, develop it and have it go forward into this next season. Uh, you know, what are we going to see from McKenzie? And then, you know, I haven't saw, seen any transactions. I believe a week ago was the start of the clock for seven days from then uh, for them to make some kind of a move with uh, Cal Quantrill. We know the scenario with Quantrill, you know, he was on the hook to come back this year and earn like six, six point six. Uh, million dollars and uh, you know they've had to move move make some moves related to him they traded away Lopez they went out and got uh, they traded away De Los Santos as well and then they went out and got Scott Barlow he's a veteran he can be in their bullpen Uh, he's had saves I think he had 13 saves for the for the Royals uh, in this most recent time so there's you know there's there's going to be a lot of shuffling around but I think the bottom line for this franchise going forward is can they get more power? Can they uh, get, you know, get some guys that can put the ball, get the ball out of the ballpark uh, because they run pretty well. They play defense. You know, they had two gold glovers once again, yep. the same two guys. So they Juan can do and that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Kwani and, and Jimenez. And uh, so, you know, they both can get the job done as far as that is concerned. They just need more power. They got it. They got to find a way to get power. There's names thrown out there, you know, Soler, you know, again, we're in that time of the year, Chase, where yeah. names are going to start popping up, you know, like mushrooms in a, in a, forest. I got a name for you. I want to wait until 
Uh, I, I, there's a couple of things I'll talk about pitching. Are you concerned about Class A? Are, are you concerned what you saw last year? Well, I think first of all, the the clock got to him in the in the beginning there, and I think that was a big adjustment for him. But what I think a lot of people aren't are realizing is that he had very few uh, save situ. He had a lot of save situations that were one run affairs, and uh, I'm not making excuses for him, but there was a lot on his plate, and I think there were a lot of sometimes guys will have save situations where it's. It's they they walk in and they've got a three run lead and they give up one or two and, and they they come out with the save. Um, he didn't have that kind of a situation for himself last year. Mm -hmm. I think it caught up to him just a bit. And again, in the beginning of the year, I think he was a bit rattled um, with the way uh, the clock uh, shifted, how he was out there on the hill. Some of the, you saw a lot of the kids that came up from the minors, like Bybee and uh, Williams and Lo and Logan Allen. They came up and they didn't seem to have any troubles because last year it was used in minor league baseball, uh, uh, you know, to test out the the the, the clock as it were. So, yeah. but I think it was an issue for Emmanuel Classe. But uh, you know, who's back there with him? You know, you got Stefan who's back there with him. Uh, they, you know, they did trade away uh, Lopez, who was a late innings kind of a guy. Um, I shouldn't say they traded him away. He got a three year deal for I think three years, 10 million a, a season down in Atlanta. So, um, and more power to him, you know, if you yes. can get paid, get paid. Yeah, but, man. uh, yeah. So I, you know, I'm, I'm just excited to see what these young pitchers can do if they can get more power. Uh, and, and then you kind of go from there. You know, that's a really good point. The lack of power hitting and maybe run support, Definitely yeah. plays a role in a lot of relief pitching. And I'm sure it's mental too. And if you lose a couple straight, which he did, then, it, you know, it's, I think pitching is very much a mental, like very like a mental battle, just as much as it is, you know, a uh, one-on-one -on -one battle against the batter or the runners or whatever. It's very mental. And it definitely yeah. seemed it wasn't, uh, some of the celebrations were extra, like when he did get an, a save, he was like, oh, he was really needed that one or something. It seemed very yeah. emotional yeah. for him, which I'm sure it was. Yeah, but, you know, a couple of years in a row, 40 saves, certainly yeah. nothing to sneeze at, a no. very strong accomplishment in Major League Baseball. That's the toughest job, man. You know, you're out there. Mm -hmm. One night you have a rough night. And, you know, if, if you're if you're Travis Kelsey, like last night, he had a rough night, you know, playing pro football. But he's got eight days to, you know, get his mindset for the next time he goes out on the football field, whereas Emmanuel Class A, you blow it on a Tuesday, you're back out there pop more than likely on Wednesday night. You got to get the job done. So the Guardians and I think myself, uh, John, are really banking on some of their young guns to provide some power. I would, you know, I, I think they're going to feel pressured to add a name for power. Yeah. But one thing we know about this, you know, <laughs> about this, they don't cave to fan pressure who they want or what, you know, whatever. And I, I think they're going to roll with, with Manzardo coming up and some of these young guys that have, uh, you know, and, and triple A by, I, I think they're going to see what they got, man. I don't think they're going to try to bring in a big name this off season. I don't. Well, I, I, I think you also have to look around the division. I would get the sense that you might see a slight pulling back of how much uh, expenditures are going on up in Minnesota, uh, how much they're going to have uh, towards their final uh, payroll numbers. Uh, and that being the case, uh, that could open things up for Cleveland. Um, I yeah. would expect to see uh, Manzardo, uh, someone to really watch in spring training. Um, they certainly had their eyes all over him in the Arizona Fall League, things of that mm -hmm. nature. So someone like that is going to be kind of like the the uh, the poster boy for Guardians baseball down in Goodyear, I would assume, uh, next spring. And then, uh, again, uh, the maturation process of those young pitchers that they have. Um, you still have Stefan, who's you know been a steady guy for them for the most part in the back end of the bullpen. You've got Class A, who is an all-star you have those two gold glovers. You've got, we haven't even mentioned Josh Naylor's name. And right. he was the one guy who went down uh, towards the end, uh, towards that deadline that really affected this ball club. It just a real baller. And we haven't mentioned Jose. Um, you know, so much of what uh, the, the good fortunes of this team in the last seven, eight years have been centered around this young guy who got a, only got a $25,000 bonus to sign out of Bonnie. Uh, the Dominican Republican, look what he's turned into, just, you yeah. know, franchise player. So there's some real good pieces, parts 
on no this good. club. Going to be fun to see exactly how things kind of shake out for them. We'll see what happens there. It's going to be really hard to not just be really, really, really excited about the, the prospect of what this could look like moving forward. I mean, it's just so many strong pieces. It would, especially with, with the young pitching, you, you can have some young pieces in the lineup, but to partner that with just all of this, you know, potential in the pitching staff. I mean, it's just, let's go, John, let's go. I, uh, <laughs> I think 2024, I think it could be magical. I really do. Well, there, there certainly is potential because if, if those kids mature, the starting pitchers mature and they fortify that bullpen and get a little bit more power, um, you know, you start, you, your start out is as good a shape as just about anybody in, in your division. Certainly, uh, can play with the Twins day in and day out, the White Sox, the Royals, and what have you, and Detroit. Um, it's and it's a good division to be in. Um, yes, there's you know a lot of teams that are you know they're kind of changing their psyches, how they're playing baseball, and the way baseball changed a year ago. Um, teams that were scrappy and you know uh, uh, ran a lot. The, I think the Guardians were fifth in the league in stolen bases, so you know they had the ability to make things happen with their legs. I would expect more of that, but if they can get more power, that they can obviously rely on. Now, like a year ago, they they thought that uh, Josh Bell would be an answer, and he didn't seem to be at least not in a Guardians uniform. And uh, you would hope that. You know, Bo Naylor matures a bit, gets a little bit more pop and a little bit more uh, seasoning on his bat in terms of, you know, knowing what types of uh, pitches certain pitchers will use against him. He'll mature. I think he's going to be there for quite some time now. He's a young talent yeah. that they can kind of, you know, um, look at as as a, a kind of a cornerstone. They got Jimenez, obviously Kwani. You know, there's talent there. Uh, you always have the issues of, you know, everybody uh, whining about straw. You know, he's a phenomenal fielder, but, you know, yeah. it always seems like when there was a big moment in the game, uh, look who's coming up to the plate. It was Miles Straw. <laughs> you, you want some you want someone other than Miles Straw for the most part. You know, yeah, I don't know. I don't want to knock the kid, but in some ways you do. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I'll say this. Um... Monzardo is a great baseball name. That is a <laughs> great name on the back of a jersey, and uh, I, I I think very easily if he has a couple strong games with the jump, be some Monzardo fever going on, man. And uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I, I'm expecting a lot of great things, and they're doing a lot of work on the ballpark, progressive yeah. fields, you know. So it's just going to be. I I think they're really preparing for a strong three, four, five, five year run of sellouts and just a lot of fun at the park and uh it's already a, a fun experience like even even last year was great i mean i, I just think partner that with a, a winning club that's like yeah let's go john i'm i'm all on board man i am all all on board let's go hey man it's you know it's late november and you want uh you want it to be early uh april already, already you know? man let's go <laughs> It's going to be great. Now, you know, there's there, there can be a level of excitement for this team, and it, it's a new era. You have to say, you know, new the, the ballpark's not going to be totally redone. It's going to take another year, but you're going to have changes that were, you know, weren't there a year ago. It's got you people going to walk into the ballpark in April and go, whoa, okay, this is yeah. cool. That you know, I'm looking forward to that, uh, whatever the changes may be. You have a new manager, you've got three outstanding, you know, prospects as starting pitchers that can only grow. And you got their control for many years. Uh, mm -hmm. Then you have Jose Ramirez anchoring the offense, along with Josh Naylor, his little brother Bo. You've got two very good uh, uh, defenders, if you will, or, or guys with gloves, and the Gold Glovers out there. So there's a lot of things to get excited about. I, I think you also have to be pragmatic as well and not figure that everything that you planned on happening happening perfectly does just that because a lot of you know, sometimes the best laid plans of mice and men are just a disaster. But I, this I don't, is a podcast. That. That's what we do. It's all going to work <laughs> out, John. <laughs> there are no rules here, baby. <laughs> oh, man. Well, this has been so much fun. Uh, I can't wait uh, just for the season to come. Until then, we have Cavs. And I think there's another team in Cleveland that's uh, surpassing yeah, expectations. Yeah, uh, apparently they've been making uh, waves lately. I, yeah. I can't quite catch their name. I'm trying to. You know anybody yeah. that talks about it? You get, of course, you've got pods that talk all about it. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, man. Talk Holly Wetzel, Tyvis Powell, they're doing their thing. Yep. They, they got a great, great job. And Sam Amico, John, and I talk about the Cavs. We got Cleveland sports all covered, John. Uh, exactly. And, man. Uh, you're you're a 
three spot. Um, we don't really have one for the charge, but you, you got the three spot and cleanup. You, you do it all, man. You do it all. <laughs> um, well, that does it for this episode of the Chase Smith Podcast and the Guardians of the Land MLB Podcast. Thank you all so much for Ooh. downloading and listening. Shouts to the Press Play Podcast Network for making this possible. Follow us online at Press Play Pods. Visit our website, pressplaypodcast.com, to keep up with all of our shows and network news and sponsorship information. If you enjoyed today's episode, Leave us a review. A five-star rating would be awesome. It really helps people as they're looking to find what pod to listen to, uh, to say, hey, this pod sounds pretty good. Um, John, plugs all that you can plug, man. Where where are you at on the airways? We want to hear more of John Telich. Uh, that's really kind of you. Uh, again, I've, I've had a podcast uh, that I started when I was still doing uh, every uh, uh, television every night at Fox 8. It's called Telich Talks. You mentioned it before, so I appreciate you allow- allowing me. And... Um, the beautiful thing about the pod, as you know, because you've got your own network of various types of shows, is that you can you can talk about uh, different um, different bents that people uh, have in their lives, and that's the best way I could describe what my pod Telich Talks is all about. I've had Sandy Alomar on, I've had former players, I've had current players, and all that. Uh, most of the time, my stories are uh, people that have found maybe have come to that. Uh, you know, that fork in the road and they made a decision that re- altered their life. And uh, it could be coming out of uh, dealing with cancer. It could be a, a, a situation where they were being bullied at school, all different types of uh, stories that I've been able to uncover uh, through, uh, geez, I've done 120 uh, episodes of it. So I really love doing it. If you give us, a, uh, give, give me a chance. I'd, I appreciate that. That's uh, Telich Talks on all of your podcast uh, platforms and uh, just people that inspire and want to make a, a difference uh, in their lives and other people's lives. And uh, it's real fun because when I did TV all those years, there were a few opportunities for us to really sit down and dig our teeth into, into subjects, you know, mm-hmm. and which you do, you can do, we can do with right. podcasts every day of the week. You yeah, really want to break down you know, the, the the double play combination of the Cleveland Guardians, you can spend 40 minutes on it if you want. And yeah. there'll be a lot of people that want to hear that type of talk. Or you can talk about uh, cleanup hitters around Major League Baseball or, or you know, is baseball uh, going too fast? Do they need to change the rules from what they did a year ago? All that stuff. So that's what I've had a, a real lot of fun doing on the pod, Chase, is to dig deep talk for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 50 minutes with someone and really find out what makes them tick and what part of their life to kind of steer them to the point where they are right yeah. now. So talk, it's, it's fun doing it. Thanks. Talk about gardens. You just had Gabriella Cruz on who's the, yes, host of the guardians about her, her, um, her charity love doesn't shove, which is an incredible story. Um, that if, if you get a chance, check that episode out on Telich talks. Uh, she's, Thanks, she's man. been on guardians of the land before we've had her oh, on yeah. to help talk guards. So, um, <laughs> John, thank you so much for t- for tonight. This has been great, and uh, you, you have it, a man. wonderful holiday season. Same to you. I hope you and your young family do. Uh, me and my old family will try to uh, manage the same. <laughs> All right. All right. Be safe. Thanks, thank please. you, sir. You got it, buddy.